Let's go back and review a couple of scriptures we encountered on this trip. The first is in Romans. Chapter 15. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to praise ourselves. He's telling everybody here to pick up a burden. Don't just pick it up, but carry it until God takes it from you. If you pick it up, I can guarantee you he'll take it from you. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. There's a story off from here with Cain and Abel. And Cain asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? The answer was yes. You are his keeper. And if your brother doesn't make it, it's most likely you won't either. Just that simple. Notice from the New Testament, asked some, some of the same question. We just talked about one's neighbor. We asked the question, and hey, who's my neighbor? That's how the Good Samaritan story in the Bible. That man that the Samaritan cared for is not his next door neighbor. Your neighbor is anybody God puts in your pathway. And God expects you to care for them yourself. You're taking the easy way out for too long. I think I'll pray for you. I'll be honest. How many of you are ever sitting on paper for somebody and you didn't do it? Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. Everybody has to be up. We've all done it. So I'll pray for you. And sometimes days later, as watching TV, the person comes across our mind. And between commercials, Let's say, Lord, remember so and so. And that's our prayer. If we forgot about him until then, God dropped on your heart, back in your mind. We said a brief prayer and continue to praise ourselves. And that's unacceptable to God. For when Christ pleased not himself, suppose he did. Where will we be tonight? We would not be seated together in heaven and place in Christ Jesus. That's for sure. In fact, if Christ had pleased himself, he'd never come down. And he came down and he left the scripture correct and says that he that was rich became poor, that mute through his poverty might become rich. He treated everything. He treated heaven. For us. That was his pleasure. That was his love. And for Christ, we ought to display the same love that he displayed in caring about other people. If you care about other people, God will take care of you. Just that simple. Can't see, can't afford it. That good Samaritan, from the way the story reads, he never considered the cost of the situation. He didn't go to he didn't see the man and say, well, I'm going to pray for you. And they go to church and ask the church for an offering to help the man. Whatever need God gives to you, he's going to give you sufficient means to take care of yourself. That's just how God does. He's never going to give you a project that you can't handle. Ever. And so you come in your pocket, as he did, took me to the doctor, to the hospital, paid for part of his bill, left him there. He said if they owe any more, when he comes back, 
Bill Pedroesta, he's a committee of one, taking care of a neighbor he didn't know, that God put into his pathway. That's how God does it. It's not going to be something. That good Samaritan did not have that kind of encounter every day. Something like that probably happened once in his lifetime. Maybe twice. There's enough people in God's house for God to spread it around. When it comes your way, he expects you to handle it. Just because he's going to give you the means to do it. Okay? Freeman Christ preached not on his own self, but as, as is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And he took it. It says, He who him own, his own self bear our sins in his own body. And he did. For what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning? That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience Whatever God is doing in your life, it's for this reason. Patience. Mommy. So before, patience is not how long you endure something, but it's how you endure it long. We get assignments we don't want many times. And the person who's assigned to us, we put some time to know that no, I, I, I only do this because I'm saved. <laughs> they should never hear that from us. They should get the impression that they're, that they're doing something, you're doing something for them, that you ask God to do, that you really want to do. And they do it with pleasure. With a smile on your face, as pleasing the Lord. That's your servant. He's the, the chief shepherd. He gives assignments. The individual who's assigned to you has nothing to do with the whole situation. Mm -hmm. This is about pleasing the one who assigned you. Bottom line. And that's to cause you to serve everybody acceptably with God. Mm -hmm. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, it says that my, God might grant it to you, you ask him for it. The Lord grant this to me, to, to be like Jesus, and like my to one another, according to Jesus Christ. Turn to Galatians. So what about them? What are they feeling? What are they going through? How is the situation impacting them? Jesus was not a man of sorrow by accident. Is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief? How do you get to be that way? By sharing other burdens. If we can't ask to be like Jesus in sidestepping on those issues, we all like having fun. We all like good times, we all like feeling good, we like for life, we all like for life just being okay. Then something comes across your ears or your eyes where you see that somebody else is not as okay as you are. 
And so God expects you to drop your okay and pick up their not okay and carry it until they're okay. Just that simple. And that's going to bring grief and sorrow in your life. It's going to happen. Somebody said having trouble in their marriage? You have trouble. You can't say what that's now. They never got married. Somebody has to work with their kids. They said, well, that's not their kids. They shouldn't, they shouldn't have raised them different. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever should or shouldn't have done is your own. That's right. As a military, I sit down, complain to my friend from Texas. He said, oh, Steve, I'll tell you. If Gibson Buster came in, that's what I have a party. I never complained to him again. <laughs> Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fall, you which are spiritual, restore such an individual in the spirit of being high toned. If I were you, <laughs> what you should do, what you shouldn't have done, that's not a spirit of meekness. The spirit of meekness becomes them. With whatever faults they may have, the spirit of meekness takes on that person and says, okay, this is what they're in. How can I fix it? Right. Or how can I help it? So they're calling by the phone and talking about it. I've got some things my say, right? I've asked a couple of individuals, I said, well, have you been praying about me? Have you been praying for me as much as you've been talking about me? Mm -hmm. I was looking, the brain's looking in their face like, you know? Have you been lifting me up as much as you've been dragging me down? <laughs> what do you do? It says, it says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Those things that you can't judge a man until you walk in his shoes. <clears throat> and God has a way of putting in somebody's shoes if you think you don't have those shoes. <laughs> He'll fit you with them. That's what means here being tempted. Bury one another's burdens and so fulfill the love of Christ. What are two great laws again? They're real simple. His commandments are very simple. He only gave us two. I'm paraphrasing this one. Love God. With everything in you. If you do that, number two becomes automatic. And to love thy neighbor as thyself. He said, like, don't do some stuff with an unsaved husband, unsaved wife. It's not going to happen one bit to say you shouldn't have married that person. They did. They're married to them. Now they come to you with the burden of going through this resolve, man. And you're supposed to act like it's you. <laughs> Nobody needs to be beat up. Wow. Especially when life is beating you up. Wow. You know? Yeah. Life's going to do that. Life itself is going to knock you down. <laughs> over and over again. Life itself is going to take the first opportunity it can to kick you while you're down. <laughs> and the last one you should be participating in should be your brother and your sister. Right? I go to these church services sometimes. I talked to a friend of mine. I went to a, so they went to a church service in the neighborhood. And they went for prayer. And she said, I thought what she said one time. How the Spirit doesn't knock folks down. Jesus never prayed for anybody they fell out. Slaying the Spirit, I heard her talk. I was slaying the Spirit. The Spirit just knocked me out. It's a good thing somebody's having to catch me. 
Don't prepare for a headache. It's fear to knock me out, but I don't prepare to knock the back in. <laughs> my philosophy has always been, if it's a spirit that's doing the work, let them fall. Does that make sense? If the spirit knocked you out, then the spirit should go to the man who's safe. There's no need somebody saying that to catch you when the spirit's starting, you've got to help the spirit out now. The spirit goes boom, and then, you know, if you're going to catch you, you're in bad shape. The Lord is the spirit that knocked you out. So he says in John, try the spirits. Spirits don't do that, not the spirit of God. All through the Bible, we saw the spirit of God, those who have the spirit, raising folks up. That man begging at the, at the temple, we're going to get to the point, when Peter and John passed by, and you know, he, he's asked for alms. They said, silver and gold have we not. But such as we have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they went to jail for it. But the Spirit lifts folks up. Mm -hmm. If you can't lift somebody up, you know, our, our whole job. Put them to one word. Edify. If you can't build somebody up, don't bother. Just ignore them. Leave them alone. If you can't encourage somebody, don't say anything. Why get something discouraged if somebody's already dis discouraged? How's that going to help? You know, I, was, I put on our two cents and like, you know, well, if you don't win you, it should you, as if we're up here and have no problems. We were all sinners. That's as bad as it gets. And the reason we're not sinners is because somebody extended grace to us, and the grace and mercy and the compassion that God had on us, he expects us to have on everybody who needs it. Without any questions, without judgment, without assessing the situation, and putting our two cents in and our analysis on it, he says, expects us to just do it. That's nerve to ask that man what he's doing in Jericho Road by himself. He said, well, where, where do you think the most important? Why did you carry money with you and the, the, the things you're going to steal? He didn't ask that man one question, did he? He just helped him. That's all God asked the list, just to help the situation and to question it. You know, nobody's going to ask that person more questions than they already have. You get into trouble, you, 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 you beat yourself up, don't you? Yes. You blame yourself, if I, should I, could I, would I, and all that kind of stuff. Nothing like somebody coming along in a new life and does the same thing to you. I bet that already. That didn't help me one bit. And you rehearsing the second time I'm a bit, a bit eater, I need help. What can you do to help me? For if a man think himself to be, here's the problem, to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. All of us in here are nothing. We're a big room full of nothing. Amen. Amen. How can somebody who's a sinner think he's anything? I was lost, I was sinking, I was dead, I was outside the will of God, and I got, I think I'm something better. And that's just to say that we are all the way through our Christian life. We're a society of sinners redeemed by grace. Now we can't have grace and mercy. Where is that person going to get it from? The world's not going to give it to him. But let every man prove his own work. This is the he proved his own work. That was his work. And he proved it. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone. And not in another. I don't want to live on someone else's testimony. I don't want to live on what and hear what you did for somebody. I want my own testimony. I'm rejoicing in myself and not in yours. And God's going to give you that opportunity to do so. For every man shall bear his own burden. What is your own burden? Bearing somebody else's burden. I read that, I thought it contradicted verse 2. It says, bearing one another's burdens. This is where mention bear his own burden. What's your own burden? The Lord is going to answer, by the way. Your own burden is bearing their burden. Okay? Let's go to Acts. Chapter 2. The Pentecostal chapter. I have to pretend that Pentecostals are watching me on YouTube. In some cases, I believe they are. 
I feel like I'm teaching them. I'm preaching them. Gene Scott used to call him closet watchers. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching the secret. They come out and preach what they saw in the closet. And it's not right because it's, it's your message. Come on, Dean. Had a line one of his poems a long time ago. He says, putting your ideas in a track I laid is like pulling my pin and not my grenade. <laughs> can't do it. This is my track. You can't lay your line on my track. Expect to blow up like I do. <laughs> I mean, Pentecost was hard. The Apostle John. So some of y'all don't, don't, don't know anything about where I'm coming from. So you do. My former church, I came out under a bulletin. They had on the cover page, like we had a description on our cover page. They had where we preach the apostolic doctrine. I told that time about my mother. I preached my dad's church and my mother was confirmed by somebody after church and they asked him, they asked her, was he, was he apostolic? Was he Pentecostal? My mom's answer was kind of weak, but she did the best she could. She said, well, you should be sure that the pastor didn't have anybody come here and preach who's not Pentecostal and Apostolic. I said, you tell me next time I do that, I'm more Apostolic and Pentecostal than anybody I know. Mm -hmm. And I preach the more Apostolic doctrine than Pentecostal doctrine than anybody I ever heard. Because mm -hmm. don't say being baptized in Jesus' name and speaking in the tongues of the Spirit of God because you're not Pentecostal. Clarence Morris said one time, he said, Steve's a shame that you got to go to a church. The first night preaching in the meeting, you have to mention those two things. And once you mention those two things, you can say that Jesus got hit by a truck. And it'll fly. As long as you believe in baptism in Jesus' name for the Holy Ghost. My whole point of the making, and this issue with John, is that this is a special apostle. He's one that Jesus loved. And he writes in his book, I haven't come to him yet, but he says, We know, hereby we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, over and over again, and never uses tongues. That's about how we know we're born of God, how we know that God is in us, we know, we know, we know, and there's he never misses baptism either. Not one time. He never, never misses speaking in tongues one time, and this is one of the pillars. He's the last one standing. He gave the last message to the church. In his last message, he never mentioned what they call Pentecost doctrine. That's why I hope they're watching me right now. Call me up. <laughs> Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I haven't heard this before. I preached all message on this, but it's time for it to get again. I got a few messages in my archives that more or less me. I'm going to preach again. This was important. The last commandment they have from Jesus was in chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Luke this information here. He says in verse 3, being seen of them 40 days. Then he says, wait for the promise of Father. Verse 5, be baptized the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The way to that point was unknown. He said, how long to wait? This one guy gave us the first information. For a little while. The book of 
John, he put that, he, he makes it, he said over and over again. Yet a little while you see me. A little while you see me, huh? Then he said, what do you mean by it? Yeah, a little while you see me, a little while you see me now. He says, are you guys disgusting? Well, you know, a little while, a little while you see me. Over and over and over again, God wants to get across a point, he, he beats him to death. You know what I now? He's going to go to heaven. You won't see me. But a little while he will see me. How are you going to see me? I'm going to come back again. He says, I will come back to you as the Holy Ghost. I'll send back my spirit called the Comforter. How long is the interval? We know. On the 50th day, 50 means Pentecost, Holy Ghost came. But they had no idea what the Holy Ghost was going to be. I may have taken it too far in the other direction, sometimes trying to get across the point. But the Holy Ghost, I say, could have been brought by UPS. <laughs> they didn't know. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until it comes. He didn't give any sign for it. Put yourself back in your place. They were not expecting speaking tongues to get saved. They were already saved. You understand that? The Pentecost, the church is officially born. But it wasn't for their salvation. They were saved already, or they never got, they, he never given the commandment. They had been saved. They have been walking there for a long time, three and a half years. Now, little one. Man, wait. How long? We don't know. Put himself back in the shoes. Right? There's this is big room. We're gathered together. And we're all going to wait for all of us to come. And being human, we're more likely to think that it's going to come sometime between 9 and 5. Right? Mm -hmm. You're not expecting the Holy Ghost to come until about the morning. <laughs> you get to figure that God's sending us another one, I'm going to be here that late, around the clock. So what do they do? They drop in and out. They came in, you know, someone had a cup of coffee. So I brought some donuts or something. They said, anything happened there? Has, has it come in? Oh, it's coming. Oh, it's coming. Except once it came, I got to go pick up your kids and leave. You got to go to work so you leave. They're coming in now, so on and so forth. Well, they're not going to go to work. They're going to go to work. They're going to go to work. They're going to go to work. It says here, the key is right here in verse number one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Who's the all? All 120. And when they all were together in one place, God put them on one accord. The hardest part for us to get in one place. If we're all in one place on Sunday morning at 1 o'clock when it's time for service, we're all in one place, God will come down and be here. And heal. That's how important it is. It's just that important. They'll be here on time. They're in one place. They're in one place, they're in one accord, and... When they got there, this is the first time in 10 days that they were all in one place. Before that, they were coming and going. They were like a shift. But then they all got together, all 120. Holy Ghost came as soon as they were together. And suddenly, why well, I say suddenly, because before somebody leaves, right. suddenly there came from heaven a sound from heaven. It's not worth going to church if you're going to hear a sound from heaven. Right? We shouldn't expect to hear a sound from heaven when we go to church if we're not putting our part in. We're all priests to offer up sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God. I should come to church expecting to hear a sound from heaven. I should come to church expecting to get healed. If I come to church sick, I mean, if I'm sick, the, the one place I should try to press myself out is to the house of God expecting to get healed. That's right. That's why I go to the doctor. Don't make us a doctor expect to feel worse. Do you? You make it your business to get to the doctor because I know I get there, he's going to prescribe something for me to make me feel better. Right? You don't get well before you go. So I'm feeling better when I go to the doctor. You get to the point where you can't take it no more. Then you call 911. If you can't get it on your own, you call that ambulance. You don't care what it costs. Right. <laughs> you don't consider if you got insurance or not. Mm -hmm. You just call up. 
And you wait right there, and they, they get there, and you tell the man what's wrong with you because you know when I tell them what's wrong, they're going to either fix me right here, I'm going to feel better right here, or they're going to take me there. Yeah. Right. Why do you do God so much different? <laughs> the worst it gets, the more of a struggle I expect to get to the house of God, and then God fix me. Come there expecting to fix me. And if I, 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 I wound it, if I can just touch the him with his garment, I'll be made whole. Yes. That's the word in the Bible. That's her own scripture. She made it up. There's no place in the Bible that says you touch him with Jesus' garment and get home. She says to herself, if I, can just, if I can just do that. And she crawled through the street because of the press, and she finally got reached out and grabbed the healing garment. He said, who touched my clothes? Wow. He didn't heal her. It says, virtue went out from him. He couldn't help it. God can't help but to heal you when you touch him. But you got to touch and expect to get him. Your expectations are going to decide how, what kind of drive you have in you. You know? You know how energetic you get when you go to the bank to cash a check? <laughs> <laughs> you move heaven now. <laughs> and break the head out of your way. You're going to knock him down. You know? Somebody in the bank will fill out the, the paperwork and you, you go around there and they look at you look, you ain't lying. <laughs> At home. <laughs> <laughs> serious about getting some money. I'm gonna spill out already. Next line. <laughs> oh, not me. Getting asked for the same situation. I'm getting to him. I'm getting what I need from God, and nothing will stop me. That's what she did, and, and, and she got him. And it says that the way we reach the Greek, so he kept turning around. Who touched my clothes? And the disciple says, Master, you're being bumped around by all kinds of people in the press and the throng and everything. He said, Who touched me? Because something went out from him. I mean, he could not have controlled it, but he didn't know who touched me. He didn't know who he sent it out to. But the fact that he didn't know who it was meant that when she touched my face, it just left God wow, wow. Wow. and hit her. And she just made it home. She didn't answer because she knew she was illegal. According to the law of Moses, she shouldn't have been out in the of blood. But she couldn't take it no more. 12 years with this issue. Her life is ebbing away. She said, I'm going to go see Jesus. The ultimate, the supreme physician, I'm going to go see him because I know he'll fix it. you got to come to God knowing it's going to be done. When you have to prepare, you have to prepare knowing that this is the end of it. This is it. When this is done, I'm going to be delivered. To just agree that you're going to act like you're delivered and you're going to get the prayer. And it's, it's the relief that takes you, it's, it's the, the idea of relief that drives you to a dentist when you have a bad tooth thing. You know that when it's all over, it's either going to be fixed or removed. Right? Either way, it's going to be gone yes, and I'm going to be in pain. Yes. You go to God the same way. Yes. When I get to God and ask for prayer, it's, gone, it, it, it's as good as gone. Yes. You're talking about you know, life after the two days. Yes. <laughs> you pass this billboard going to the dentist. It has a big sandwich there, you know? <laughs> that looks so good, but you couldn't begin to buy it because you're too thick. But when I come back, <laughs> I'm stopping there. Jesus. Jesus. I go to the dentist, and I tell me the dentist, right? So I don't understand me. So we get the dentist. I'm, you know, let's, let's go by this little restaurant here. So you can eat, you, you can eat, I said, look, it ain't hurt no more. I'm good to chew. <laughs> now it says, Pentecostals, verse 4, and they're all filled with the Holy Ghost. Break it up like the Bible does. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost before they can speak in tongues. It says, and began to speak in other tongues. This they began speaking in other tongues and were off with the Holy Ghost. It says they were off filled first and began to speak in tongues. It wasn't the tongues getting the Holy Ghost. The tongues were for the ones who were there. It tells you. Verse 6, and when this is noise abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded. Because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled. Same one to another. Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how I hear we every man in our own tongue, where we were born? Parthians, and Medes, and Edomites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, 
and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Greeks and Arabians, we do here to speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Mm. Which means what? They understood the message. Mm -hmm. They understood. That's my problem with tarot committees. We're going to be a tarot in the church and verify somebody speaking in tongues. We all know what they're saying. Yeah. The sinners did. Mm -hmm. If the sinners knew what they're saying in their spoken tongues, then those who are saved, who are overseers, or those who speak in tongues, ought to know what the message is. Put them in separate rooms, the person gets the Holy Ghost, and have them write down what the person said. <clears throat> Put them in a sealed envelope, breaks the pastor, and start reading what they said. How long do you think a church committee is going to last? Mm -hmm. Not too long. They're talking like, they're discussing like a dog. He can have a faith. He just can't believe the guy that's getting the Holy Ghost now, and he's going to question me. Well, yeah. If I was Satan, what better way to put tears in the church? Right. Hmm. Satan's been speaking in tongues for a long time. You have those voodoo dancers down in, in Haiti and have you, they speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. It's part of the same one. He can do that. Yes. What Satan can't, the thing that Satan cannot do is love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no capacity for that. No. Leave no. that. Chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4. Pick up the message we had Sunday. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God? Judging. Hmm. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, God got these two unlearned, ignorant fishermen, fishermen are really coarse men, <laughs> to stand before the Sanhedrin and Council and preach. And they saw these men. They saw their boldness. One thing a person who has Jesus ought to be is bold in professing Jesus. Hmm. You know? It's, it's, the world's not going to be persuaded so much for what you say. They're going to be persuaded by your attitude of sin. You know, these men step to the the council like, like they belong there, like they ran the council. And they declared Jesus. And the men in the council who were, who were educated and learned men, they took lives of them and these men are educated, un uneducated, and unlearned and ignorant. But what does it say there? But it took, but it took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What's going to make you pre pre present Jesus in a, in, in a convincing way? Your boldness. You're excited about him. Somebody was talking about Jesus. I get excited. I don't care where I'm at. Who I'm talking to. I get winded. You know? I preach more, I preach with more energy to one person who wants to hear about Jesus and have to, to the church all the time. To just agree that I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of offering time. <laughs> because I work. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot but speak the things as we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorify God for that which had been done, for the man was about 40 years old when this miracle of healing was showed. How old are you? This one, that's, in, that's in God's range. It's 31. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. This man was 40. Never walked in his life. All of a sudden, he jumps out. There was no test walk. No, let's see how it goes. He got a nine year jump on that man. Why wouldn't God heal him? Why shouldn't God heal him? If he was 80, it wouldn't make any difference. That's right, man. That's right. Either God can or he can. If he can, he, you know, he'll hang up his hand. It's just shingle then. Right? That's not going to lie. I've talked about it. So, look, you can't do this, and you need to tell me. 
If it's outside the scope, you just say so. If you just do little things like headaches and stuff like that, you know, although God has done some big things here in, in the way of healing, I still, you know, you're in that level, you need to let me know. So we can quit wasting your time and our time. But if we can do it, though, I think it's time you do that. Amen. That's what I said to him. I'm going to tell you what I said. <laughs> and I'll be very early. Here you go. This is bothering me. It's kept me awake. I, I can't tell you how many, how many healing exercises I've gone through in, in these two cases. Mm. Over and over again, I, I, wake, I wake up from dreams, and, and I'm, in, I'm in the middle of service. Shouting mm -hmm. at God. Mm. You ever snore a lot and wake, up, wake yourself up snoring? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a funny sound when you're, when you're still asleep. <laughs> you realize it's you. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up now, I'm, I'm, I'm discussing with God on these cases. I'm, I'm arguing with God. I'm, 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 I'm you know, like Abraham was, you know, it's like, you know, you're the judge, you're, you're the healer. You said by your stripes we were healed. You mean that or not? Is that just for some people or is that for everybody? Is that for all believers or for some believers? I'm serious about this, you guys. Don't you all get that by now? Yes, man. Yes, man. Yes, got to do it. Anything less, I'm going to be disappointed. And God's going to tell me why he didn't do it. Right. I, haven't, I haven't thought in that direction yet. I haven't thought about an excuse. Mm -hmm. I expect God to do it. Yeah. But if he doesn't do it, I'm expecting God to tell me why. I mean, a God didn't hear what's going to say about the rapture, yeah. and about a first and second resurrection, mm -hmm. about the 10 days, and yet a little while, and all that kind of deep stuff. Why? This should be a piece of cake for him. Yeah. But he ought to tell me why. Mm -hmm. Please, Lord. Shouldn't you? Yes, sir. Is that asking too much? Yes, sir. I don't think so. No. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and others had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. One accord. Our fast was intended to put us on one accord. Mm -hmm. It's not some magical form to get God to do it. That's to put us on one accord. It's to put these individuals on our mind. Mm -hmm. When you're hungry, you have the instruction to think about them. Yeah. Yes. When you're hungry, you have instruction to just pray for them. So don't pray for me, don't pray for the church, don't pray for each other. Just pray for that condition. I intend to save him. I intend to get God off his throne. Mm -hmm. And to cause him to move. One accord and said, Lord, that's very good. Let me show you something. I love this. Keep your finger there, turn to Acts 9. This one, Paul, from Saul, got saved. 9 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. I'm not persecutest. You know what that did to Paul? To Saul? Saul didn't believe that Jesus went back to heaven. He never met Jesus. Hoping to run into him because he didn't really persecute him. All these folks got, you know, bewitched who are on that way, he's on the general thing, and got this new life and everything. Can you imagine what he did to him when this voice spoke from heaven and says, I'm Jesus? Here's the best part about Paul, though. He said, I am Jesus, not persecutors. It is time for the kid against the pricks, and he's trembling and astonished. Astonished why? Because this Jesus who I'm persecuting his people, he's alive. And in heaven is speaking to me, he knew me. He called my name, Saul, Saul. Mm -hmm. He didn't take the persecution on the individuals. It says, again, here's a case of, of bearing one of his burdens. He said, why are you persecuting me? Mm -hmm. Jesus took it personal. Yeah. He was in heaven. So I didn't think of Jesus. But he did to his brothers. Yeah. Because he did to his brothers, Jesus was bearing their burdens. saying, look, let me, let me stop this guy. Why are you persecuting me? Well, who, who are you? Mm -hmm. I'm Jesus. And he's trembling, here's where he got the discipline, see why God called Paul. And he's trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Sell him. 
saved. You can't meet Jesus and go away, you know, neutral. You can meet Jesus when he's alive. You either got to either got to serve him or kill him, crucify him or let, or set him free. Pilate has my idea. He presided over a trial that is still going on. It's a long as trial in history. The, the question of trial is, what then should I do with this man called Jesus? A question God it makes everybody on the earth ask about him. After you met him, he puts that question, now what do I do with him? Crucify him or let him go? If Pilate had been a man and said, I'm sorry, I ain't going to crucify him, let him go, you all do it. Yeah. Now I'm going to dump them into the Romans' hand. This is a Jew problem. This is, this is y'all's problem. And I, I, I've had a case on him. I find no fault in him. And he's sitting in the same free. And you want to kill him? You got to do that. Because since that time, the Jews have tried, been trying to put the blood of Jesus on the Romans' hands. I hate them for that. But I'll call your attention to those. Look at the word Lord in verse 5. And he says, What about Lord? I mean, John's very, very clear. In the last days, anybody who confesses that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is of God. Which is fair. Anybody who says, make a put it real simple. Anybody says that Jesus is God, has the spirit. Because when it's all over, when the great persecution comes, that's going to be the issue. Mm -hmm. He said, who will profess me before men? What profession? That profession. I'll profess it before I fall in heaven. Whoever denies me on that line, when they say, recant this and you can live, 